Hey, this is Evelyn Lopez. Welcome to Sustainability in Your Ear, the Earth911.com podcast for the week of March 4th, 2019. We are recording at the Cozy Moon Yard Recording Studio in Tacoma, Washington. And I say cozy because it is really cold outside. It has been a cold and wet winter all over our country. Um, in some places, even polar cold. Um, so today, we're going to talk about water, water everywhere. Now, if you know your Coleridge, you know that's a line from The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which did not have a happy ending. And it's followed by, nor any drop to drink. At the end of winter 2019, it's an apt description of our weather and water issues. So today, let's talk about drinking water and the water that's in our lives. And today we have a really trimmed down crew. Our publisher, Mitch Ratcliffe, uh, has a conflict today. Um, and Sarah Lozanova, who usually joins us, is out ill. But uh, Trey is here. Trey Granger, one of our writers, calling in. Trey, where are you from today? I am in Arizona, where we experienced a very unique thing at the end of February. We had snowfall. Really? Um, in Scottsdale, which is very close to where I live. Um, but it's different than other cities you would imagine, because... In Arizona, it's snowed three times in the 12 years that I've lived here. Mm -hmm. And basically, it's on the ground for maybe two hours, and then it all evaporates. Oh, so does nice. it? Yeah, it's good, because you're like, oh, it's snowing. And then, wait, it's gone. <laughs> so you get a picture before it leaves. Yeah, that's like perfect, because it doesn't snow heavily very often here in western Washington. But when it does, um, it kind of brings everything to a halt because we don't really have the maintenance equipment and we're really not set up for it. And it, um, and it usually freezes into ice. So yeah, snowing, sticking, and then evaporating is maybe the perfect, perfect snowfall in my opinion. We, we definitely shut down the city though when it happened. It's yeah. Oh, like, I believe oh, it. Let's not go anywhere because we don't know how to drive in, in rain, let alone in snow. No, it's in slippery. It's just very, <laughs> very hazardous stuff in my opinion as someone who grew up in Southern California. Uh, well, I wanted to mention before we get into talking about drinking water, we've got a couple of um, interviews uh, or programs up on the Earth 911 website. One, uh, Mitch mentioned last time, it's an interview with Catherine Kellogg, who founded GoingZeroWaste.com. And it's a nice uh, little interview, so check it out if you get a chance. Uh, she has a book coming out in April called 101 Ways to Go Zero Waste, so that should be interesting, too. And the other thing I wanted to mention was a new project of Mitch. Mitch's. He has a, a new podcast called One Person's Impact, and it's going to be focusing on making changes to improve the sustainability of our lives. He is uh, taking the first one because he recently traded in his – um, gas guzzling sports car for an electric vehicle, specifically a used 2016 BMW i3. And so he talks about, um, you know, what his thought process was, the, the concerns he had about switching to an electric vehicle, and uh, some of the challenges in, you know, bringing the household around to that idea. So that's worth a listen to. Um, but now let's talk about drinking water. Uh, and Trey, I thought we'd start out by talking about um, one of the big issues we see across the country in drinking water, and that is lead in drinking water. And um, tell me a little bit about what you know about lead in drinking water, and uh, and we can sort of chime in on what we think people should do about it. So lead in drinking water dates back a long time. Mm -hmm. um, basically, uh, pipes were originally made of lead to transport water. Um, from reservoirs into houses. And from time to time, some of that lead would leach into the drinking water. Um, many cities have replaced their infrastructure to uh, prevent that poisoning, if you will, because those who don't know about lead, it's, it's especially hazardous in um, young children. It, right. it, it harms brain development. And basically the thing that doctors will tell you is there really isn't a safe amount of lead. You can't mm -hmm. say, oh, there's a certain percentage is okay. Any lead in your system is going to be bad. It's why we don't have lead paint on houses anymore. Right. Um, so basically what we've been finding, uh, what, what stories have been popping up is lead is starting to become uh, traceable in more and more cities in their water supply, which mm -hmm. is kind of scary. 
Yeah, it really is. And, you know, I don't know what it was about lead. I think it was, it was maybe that it was uh, in plentiful supply or maybe that it was ease of, of making it. But, yeah, the pipes were predominantly lead. We had uh, lead in the paint that were used in housing. Um, and then, you know, in industrialized areas like where I live in Tacoma, we have a lot of lead and arsenic in the soil still from the Sarco aluminum plant that operated here for a long time. And it doesn't go away, or you know, if it does, it goes away like generations later. So it's it's in your environment, it's um, in your potentially in your pipes, and um, it it may not be something that is immediately obvious. And it's a very insidious uh, chemical because it does um, you know hurt the development of small children. It's also not good for people who are older or who have um, you know sort of failing immune systems, but. Um, I have not done any exploration yet. I probably should. I live in a house that was built in 1968. I We have uh, plastic pipes, but I have not done a test to see if I've got any lead in my water. And I probably should do that. Um, but one of the things that's cropping up in Washington is that a lot of our schools are testing positive for lead in the drinking fountains. And so that's causing a lot of concern. And a lot of schools are bringing in, you know, huge pallets of bottled water for the kids at school. But that comes with its own problems. I think the good news, too, is that even if you uh, did have lead in the drinking water in your homes, Mm -hmm. it can be removed. Um, One of the big things in Arizona for our water supply, a lot of people use what's called reverse reverse osmosis machines. Uh Um, Partly it's because we have very what's called uh, heavy water. Like we have the rings on the toilets because there's a lot of calcium and and other minerals in the water. Oh yeah. Um, So people will get these filtration uh, uh, systems installed into their refrigerators that they have the refrigerators that, that uh, have the the door that produces water Mm -hmm. to get rid of, of a lot of the, the minerals. Um, And they also get rid of lead at the same time. So Mm -hmm. it's something where even if your city is affected you as a consumer can take efforts to limit your exposure. Yeah. So I think the takeaway on this is first, as a citizen, do what you can to, you know, ask your city officials, ask your city water department if they do lead testing. I'm sure they do. And try to find out what your water in your area may be tested for and how frequently it's tested. You might also ask your schools that your kids are in, you know, have they done lead testing? What's their schedule for testing? In uh, Tacoma, we did have lead in our school drinking fountains, and in return, what they've done is they test all of the drinking fountains, but their schedule is to test once. Everything must be tested at least once every three years, but that may not be very satisfying to a parent. So if I were a parent of a young child, I would probably be looking at getting a filtration system in my home and then sending my child to school with a you know, with a bottle of water from home that I know is uh, is a pretty good, safe water. And uh, Sarah Lozanova has a really good article up on the Earth 911 website about um, dr- drinking water filtration systems. And these are sort of your countertop systems that you fill up with tap water and they filter it and uh, what different items cost and which ones use uh, no plastic. They are using glass and stainless steel. And I thought those looked like pretty good systems, and I might get one for my house, in fact. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point in the sense that while we definitely want to be environmentally friendly, we should always put health above all else. So when it comes to the health of yourself and your families, make sure you're getting a system that even if it might not rate the most eco-friendly, it's taking care of your drinking water and keeping you safe and healthy. Yeah, yeah. You know, we had a couple of other um, <clears throat> articles that you and I had sort of taken a look at on drinking water. One is that New York is planning to spend a billion dollars and become the first city to limit the one for dioxane, which is found in servants and detergents, solvents and detergents from getting into the drinking water after identifying it as a carcinogen. And also another story, the EPA will start listing PFAS in drinking water. And those are some of the chemicals that are related to, they probably do a lot of things, but they're particularly related to um, firefighting foam and other um, things that are used to um, you know, clean and to, and to fight fires. And what that sort of brought up to me was just that there is a lot of stuff that we're now identifying that is in our drinking water. And uh, it is 
not easy to stay on top of these issues, uh, nor is it always easy to test for and find out what is in your drinking water. Absolutely. And, and I think what you're bringing up is there's really two different sources of drinking water contamination. The first would be when it comes into your house in the first place, things mm. like uh, lead, which we talked about before, or chromium-6, which is the big topic of the Aaron Brockovich movie from, mm. um, or the Aaron Brockovich story, really, um, from the 90s. And then it's what we put in the water because of what we are flushing down the drain. Um, I remember about 10 years ago, uh, pharmaceuticals were a big issue. The EPA, or the, sorry, the Associated Press did a story uh, that found there was a bunch of remnants of uh, testosterone and estrogen and other mm -hmm. um, supplements found in drinking water because people were flushing their medications or they were uh, using the restrooms and, and it was just going through urine and the treatment plants weren't able to sufficiently uh, to remove these the supplements. Mm -hmm. And so there was concern. And that's actually why the, the department of, or sorry, the drug enforcement agency now provides collection events for people. So they don't flush their, their meds down the toilet anymore because we want to try to prevent this stuff. But it really shows you that it's not just something where it's the uh, government piping the water into your house that can be in effect. If, if you are putting stuff down the drain, you could be uh, hurting the drinking water for everybody else as well. I think that's a really good point. And that's a sort of a, you know, it's it's hard to know how to dispose of some things. That's just that's just true. And I have put things down the toilet myself that now I put in, you know, wrap in um, paper and put into the trash instead. But um, the, the rule really should be don't don't put anything down the toilet other than, you know, human waste and, and toilet paper. It's just um, not able. Our systems are not able to deal with all kinds of different things, be it. Um, even goldfish, frankly. I mean, you, you just shouldn't put down, don't put hair down there, don't put any pet-related waste down there. Um, try to keep the systems as clean as you can because our filtration systems, which are very good, but they're kind of built on the assumption that you're dealing with um, human biological waste and not a lot of other things. Right. Yeah. But in, in particular, that New York story is interesting to me because it's great to see a city, let alone the biggest city in America, be proactive and... Uh, try to address something that I think a lot of people aren't aware of. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't even know how to pronounce it really. The one for dioxin, there's a comma in there. And, right. and um, it's great to see a city say, you know what, we're going to spend some money to uh, limit the presence of this when it's not really a, a mainstream um, chemical that people are aware of. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that too. I also appreciate that, you know, I mean, cities have enormous expenses, but they also tend to have very high revenues. And so if New York can figure out how to build some systems in place to limit these solvents getting into the water system, then smaller cities and other places can maybe borrow from that. So it's, it is nice to have them take the lead and try to figure some of this out. You know, we also had an article about California uh, submitting a bill to establish a safe drinking water trust. And this was interesting to me because it kind of brings up that that core issue in politics of, you know, you're, and I'll say being a more liberal person, your more liberal side is usually thinking, you know, how can the government fix this? And then how do you fund it? And usually your answer is to fund it through a fee or a tax. And then a more conservative side would be, you know, this is a, this is ridiculous. You know, you need to either let the market figure it out or, you know, don't put taxes on everything. Because it sounds good to me to have a safe drinking water trust, but it is being paid for by putting a tax on drinking water. And it's a fairly minor tax that's proposed, or at least um, the one mentioned in the article was about 95 cents a month. So it's less than $12 a year. But, you know, um, that means that even the poorest families are going to be paying that, um, even though the, some of the poorer communities then would have that trust money available to benefit them should they find that they have some drinking water problems. So it's always a bit of a, a tug and pull over how do you identify these issues and then what do you do about them? Yeah, there was a, a stat in one of the articles I read about the California that 6 million Californians since 2012 have had water providers that violated the state standards. So that's pretty um, shocking. That's pretty significant right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's really significant. Well, and it looked like too, it was particularly a problem in the Mojave uh, desert area. And I don't, and they, and so that water's probably coming from the Colorado river. Um, 
but I don't know I don't know why those different drinking water providers would have so many violations. Right. Yeah. So you had also mentioned uh, when we were trying to put together this um, the suggestion that people could search uh, CCRs off of the EPA website to find the level of contamination in your city's water. I have never done that. So tell me how what that is and how you do that. So basically, uh, every city will test their water uh, several times a year to identify contaminants that are in even small doses. Mm-hmm. And all the results are posted uh, online. The EPA has a link on their uh, website that uh, you can search your local community and see not just your town, but every neighboring town, because you might be using drinking water or drinking fountains um, at the gym or uh, other areas that would be in different cities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you can kind of be proactive and, and decide, oh, wow, I didn't realize we just tested for chromium six um, in the city next to us. Like that's, that's a big deal. I need to um, take steps to make sure I'm, I'm uh, drinking less of the water when I go to that city. Right. Right. Well, that, you know, I am going to check that out. I have never looked at that, but that sounds really interesting. So, Drinking water, what I would say, my takeaway from looking at these different articles and thinking about it is, um, if you have concerns about your home, do some testing. But you may want to start first by checking with your water district, your water provider, to find out what testing they do in the pipes and what is in your water. You might also want to check on the EPA website to find out what's reported for your city. And also check in with your schools if you've got school-aged children and what, find out whether they're testing, what their tests show. Um, but I think that the answer to, for me is um, really look into one of these uh, water filtration systems uh, that is in Sarah's story. Uh, they were reasonably affordable, and she actually has a, a really good, almost free hack. If you've got an old uh, Brita filter system, you can uh, rework it so that it continues to filter Um, But look into that and think about, um, you know, taking the water that you know has been safe and properly filtered with you wherever you go. I don't think bottled water is a very good option. You know, the bottles are the problem. But also, you know, frankly, our drinking water systems are subject to a lot of testing and very high standards. And the bottled water industry is just not subject to the same level of scrutiny. So it looks good, but it may not be good. Yes, absolutely. And, and to me, I'm a huge water fan myself. I mm-hmm. love drinking water. It's, it's really refreshing to me. I always find it weird when people say, oh, water, it tastes weird. Yeah. And my response is, what? It doesn't taste like anything to me. Um, but I guess they're used to the sugar or something that you would get in the juice or a soda. Mm-hmm. I, I love the taste of water. So I will do everything I can to make sure that the water in my house is safe to drink because that's what I drink. 90% of my, my, intake for liquids is probably water so yeah me too me and that's the best thing to drink i mean it's what we need the most of well let's turn a little bit to water in our climate because we have been having extraordinary amounts of rain this year and one of the thing that i hear that i hear frequently is uh, because you know my family's still down in southern california a lot of my friends are southern california is well i guess the drought's over but is it yeah i, w- I was surprised when i researched this um i found an article that at the beginning of february Almost 40 percent of the continental United States, so the 48 lower states, um, were in a drought, which is shocking to me um, because I've always heard about California being in a drought. Mm-hmm. It's been in the news for several years now, but 40 percent of our land needed more rain. Luckily, we had a very wet February to help out with that, but it's, it's surprising. Yeah, it is surprising. Well, we were talking a little bit offline before we started recording, and And one of the things you mentioned, Trey, was, you know, what's being done, you know, when you get a heavy rainfall, um, what happens? I mean, does anyone make any effort to try to save up some of that water? Yeah, I I wish I could have found some some stories that uh, talked to that effort. Um, It's definitely a situation where I've seen a lot of stories about, given our our very wet uh, February, there have been stories written that, hey, we're we're safe from drought for the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, But the trick from, from my standpoint is we can't make new water. The only mm-hmm. way we get more water is via rain and snowfall. Unless we find a, a legitimate and cost-effective way to desalinize salt water, um, we, we have limited ways that we can generate new water. Rain is probably the best one. Mm-hmm. And so it would be great if we could hear more stories and if our, if our listeners 
are aware of them, please send them our way of cities that have said, you know what, we put out extra rain barrels. We're collecting as much as we can because we're going to store this rain and we're keeping it for, for the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, we got a couple of rain barrels on our house a few years ago and they're great, but, you know, they fill up. It's amazing. They fill up really fast when you get a hard rain. I mean, they'll fill up almost immediately. And then we use the water in our in our yard, but um, it it may be gone by the time, you know, we need it in August. So sure. I would say you know, we need to really think about this because I, in Washington State, it rains a lot in western Washington. And usually um, it's not really a problem to have a, a garden that's largely just watered by the rain with a little bit of addition of, of watering in the summertime. But we have had droughts uh, because our water systems are still river water and they're still highly dependent on the snowpack being built up in the mountains. So if we don't have a – if we have a wet year but not a cold snowy year in the mountains, we will have a drought in the summer no matter no matter what happens. And with our climate changing somewhat more rapidly than we previously thought – I really think that there should be more thought given to ways that either individuals, homeowners, or cities can start saving more of the water that falls from the sky. Uh, Because I don't know that we'll have – it just seems that our patterns that we've relied on for so many years are not entirely reliable anymore. Absolutely. And there are some great articles on earth911.com about how to start uh, rainwater harvesting. I definitely encourage people to check them out if you're interested on the topic. Um, One thing that was fascinating to me is uh, while it's now legal in all 50 states to harvest your own rainwater, um, Colorado was the last state to do so. And it was in 2009, I believe, they passed their uh, legislation. Um, The reason why they were hesitant at first was they were worried about consumers not having the proper training to do it. Mm. But what they what really spurned them to do so is they did a study in 2007 that found in the Denver area. 97% 97% of their rainfall got absorbed by plants. Wow. Um, so only 3% would make it to waterways and thus be suitable for human consumption. And while it's, it's absolutely important for us to keep those plants well-fed because we need plants to survive, you know, if, if we're in a drought, we can't have only 3% of the water go towards our, our uh, waterways. We've got to make sure that we can get... Uh, uh, more of that water captured by our systems and util- suitable for human consumption. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, on the positive side, we did see a couple of articles about uh, California may have another, they may or may not have a super bloom year, but they will have another strong wildflower year uh, because of the fires and followed by the, the rains. So something to look forward to after our wet, wet winter. Absolutely. Well, let's take up our Earthling questions. We have three pretty interesting questions, and I'm going to really rely on your expertise for these, Trey. Um, But the first one is Ron on Facebook asks us, uh, he says, Hi, someone dumped an old varnished table in our alley. I used the 311 app for my area in Los Angeles to get them to dispose of part of the table, but they left behind the smaller varnished wooden table legs. I'm not sure why. Maybe because the table was big and bulky, but the separated legs are not. Are the varnished table legs recyclable, or does that go in the trash? So the trick here is going to be, uh, I think people would be thinking that the varnish is what would make the trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, really, the situation is there's not a, a great deal of market for um, wood recycling in general, mm. um, what, what this is called in the, in the recycling industry is called C and D or construction and demolition. Okay. Um, there are a lot of facilities throughout the United States that will accept this material, but a lot of it is about diversion and, and um, finding alternative uses as opposed to recycling in recycling it into new wood. Mm-hmm. Um, and Evelyn, you made a great point offline that there's uh, donation opportunities. The Habitat for Humanity Restore yes. is an excellent one to consider. Um, they will uh, accept a lot of, of household products and sell them for reuse. Yes. So it could be that the local uh, restore would accept the legs and have a, a table to put them on. Yeah. Um, 
If the legs are in good shape, I think it's worth, you know, trying to take them to the restore. If they're um, scarred up and not in good shape, then, you know, realistically, they're they're probably uh, for the trash bin. Right. Yeah. But if they have wheels, I would definitely remove those wheels. They're probably made of brass and you can recycle those as scrap metal. Oh, very good. Okay. So it kind of depends on what's going on with those varnished legs. If they're in good shape, you might be able to donate them. If they've got uh, metal wheels, those might be scrap metal. Um, but if all else fails, uh, I mean, I might even look at using them in my garden, um, you know, upside down, depending on if they're attractive or not. But, um, you know, if all else fails, they are probably not for the recycling bin. They are probably for the trash bin. Yeah, definitely don't put them in the recycling bin. Right. I can't think of any city that would accept wood as recycling. No, I don't think so. Even the, even the you know, the yard waste stuff is, is not for that. Right. All right. Brian on Facebook asks... Uh, I need, or <laughs> he doesn't say I, need to dispose of a small bottle of mercury. Can you help? Asking for a friend. I always love that asking for a friend line. Yeah, I do Like it's, it's a hypothetical situation yeah. or something. Yeah. Very specific. I don't know. I don't know exactly how one comes upon having a small bottle of mercury these days. But if I found myself or had a good friend with a small bottle of mercury, I would probably call our hazardous waste disposal line and find out what they thought. And what I would expect them to tell me is, could you please bring that to us at the hazardous waste, you know, disposal facility, which is next to our, um, next to our dump, next to our environmental recycling center. And I would do so. I, it does not go down the sink. It does not go in the trash. It does not go in the recycling. This is highly, highly dangerous, hazardous stuff. Yes. And, and especially be careful when you are transporting it because, You definitely don't want to have the bottle turn over and the cap isn't secure. And all of a sudden you have mercury all over your car because mercury is airborne. And so as soon as it gets um, into a carpet, it's it's or or the leather of your car. It's really hard to remove and you're going to start breathing in those vapors. And it's definitely not good for the brain. I don't know how much exposure it takes to get mercury poisoning. I, I knew someone when I when I was in high school where I worked at a resort and the the guy who worked in the yard in the gardens had mercury poisoning as a young man, had lost all of his hair as a result and used to draw a mustache in every day. So that's why I remember. Um, but I don't know how much exposure it takes to get mercury poisoning, but it is not anything to fool around with. Let's put it this way. Uh, CFLs, the compact fluorescent light bulbs, Mm -hmm. they have about five milligrams of mercury in them. And if you break one of those in your house, the EPA is definitely encouraging you to take the appropriate measures to clean it up. Like it doesn't take a lot of mercury to uh, affect your health. Wow. Okay. So a bottle full, no matter how small the bottle is, that is very dangerous. Yes. Uh, All right. For his friend, not for him. For his friend. No. Yeah. Just for his friend. So you should be concerned for your friend. Very concerned. Uh, Our last Earthling question, uh, Manuela asks on Facebook, this is a good question, if only we had a good answer, Uh, how can I make money by recycling plastic bottles? And we don't know where Manuela lives. So I'm going to assume here that she is talking about the more common types of bottles like water bottles and and soda bottles Mm -hmm. and and beer bottles, um, which are typically made of number one plastic, the PET, mm-hmm. um, those are commonly uh, utilized or, or included in bottle bills, which there are 10 of them throughout the United States. So she may want to check and see if her state is part of a bottle bill, because mm-hmm. then there will be um, facilities throughout the state that will accept plastic bottles and pay her money for them. Um, she does need to be cautious, though, because if she lives in a neighboring state, like if she was in Idaho and she uh, could drive across to Oregon. It is against the law to drive to a bottle bill state with bottles and try to collect that deposit. Interesting. Um, so, so be aware of that. Uh, it was actually a great Seinfeld episode back in the day <laughs> about them trying to uh, drive their bottles to Michigan and, and collect all the money from them. Um, but in the other 40 states, it is going to be trickier to make money from it Um because while there is a great market for PET in the United States, the key is going to be volume. Mm-hmm. So if Manuel is able to start her own collection, and I assume Manuel is a female, mm-hmm. um, her own collection business, if she can get a truckload, she can actually reach out to NAPCOR, which is the National Association of uh, PET 
container uh, resources, and they will have PET recyclers who will buy material by the truck, but they're not going to take like five bottles and give right. her money for them. Right. They want they want it in bulk. Right. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this recently because uh, Tacoma's looking at possibly getting rid of their curbside recycling, although I, I don't think that will happen in the end. But, And I was just thinking, offhand, you know, how much, how much would people, if I were to offer to pick up um, people's bottles and their recycling and take it to the recycling center for them, what, what would people be willing to pay for that? And I kind of figure people probably would not pay more than $20 a month for that service. And so you'd have to get hundreds of people to, in order to really make any profit. Yep. So, you know, it's a it's a pretty pretty tight uh market. I don't I don't think that an individual could, but I think I think there's some business potential there if that's what you're interested in. And uh and yes, as as Trey mentioned, if you live in a state that pays uh for plastic bottles and cans, then you might be able to make some money in that state with those items. And I've said it on several podcasts in the past, if if we want to make the change it all comes down to consumers because they might not believe it, but if we start supporting companies that are using recycled recycle content in their packaging, mm-hmm. um, if we start demanding that Coca-Cola and Nestle Water and all these other companies use 50% uh, recycled PET in their bottles and going after companies that are doing that, it will change the, the mindset. It will create a demand or more of a demand for that recycled plastic. And all of a sudden, these PET recyclers are going to say, we need more material. We, we will buy it. We, we will do whatever we can to get our hands on it. Right now, we're not seeing that as much. Most of the PET that gets recycled in the United States becomes liner for fleece or mm-hmm. sleeping bags or uh, other materials. We need to start putting it more in bottles, but that's going to be relying on consumers to say, you know what, we'll pay a little more. Yeah. We want to support that uh, closed loop environment. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. You know, the other thing that I I always sort of wonder about too is, is why, you know, what's the price differential between putting something in an aluminum can versus in a plastic bottle? Because the aluminum cans are still quite good at, at being recyclable. Yep. And I think that's more an aesthetic issue of people like to see the color of the fluid inside the bottle or something. I don't know. There are plenty of benefits for using plastic over glass or metal. I'm not saying we shouldn't use Mm -hmm. plastic. Um, I think the key is we need to start using more recycled content across the board um, for all of our packaging. And it's just going to be dependent on consumers demanding that change. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, on that note, anything else you want to add about uh, water issues today, Trey? Um, We didn't touch a lot on Flint, and I definitely... If we have any listeners from Flint, you you have my sincerest condolences over what you've been dealing with for the past five years. My hope is that no American cities go through what Flint has had to go through as far as not having access to clean drinking water. I really hope that we as Americans make sure that every city has safe drinking water for our for our household. I agree. And yeah, we had some material that we'd we'd um, pulled about Flint, but I didn't get into it out of time constraints. But absolutely, Flint, Michigan is both the example of, you know, how things can go horribly, horribly wrong, and also an example of how the citizens have to become activists in order to get things corrected. So we hope that Flint, Michigan will have clean drinking water again in the not too distant future. Well, absolutely. That's it for this episode. Uh, as always, we appreciate your suggestions and feedback. You can send us email at feedback at earth911.com. And you can find us on all of your podcast platforms. And, of course, at our website, earth911.com. We will see you next time.